Welcome to another edition of Value for Money TV show, a six-week special feature put together by Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI, through its Value for Money Advocacy Project, supported by the European Union Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Act Program. The objective of the show is to discuss key accountability issues relating to public finance management in Nigeria. And today on the show, we will discuss how inefficiencies in tax collection remittance is affecting mobilization of funds for effective implementation of annual budgets. We will also highlight developmental cost of revenue losses to citizens. My name is Olusha Gmuelemo, your anchor on the show. Let's take a breather and we'll be right back. Welcome back on the show. One of the general features of public policy crafting in Nigeria is a lack of exhaustive consultation with stakeholders and intended beneficiaries. The value-added tax VAT increase from 5% to 7.5% initiated by the federal government in September 2019 generally replicate this trend. The new policy to increase VAT shows basically a weak policy conception and management structure, especially considering the high level of poverty, unemployment, as well as underemployment in Nigeria. Many state governments and private enterprises are unable to pay the 30,000 naira minimum wage, thereby limiting the purchasing power for many employed citizens and widening the inequality gap for millions of Nigerians. Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative PLSI in its analysis of 2016 audit report of the Federation discovered a total of 4.1 billion naira in taxes, including value-added tax, withholding tax, and payee not collected or remitted to the federal treasury. Inefficiencies in tax collection remittance has remained the bane of tax administration in Nigeria. Corporate entities walk away with statutorily required payments to government. Even when these taxes are collected, they are often not adequately accounted for, leaving room for under remittance and revenue leakages. It has been observed that apart from salaried employees, most citizens' companies in Nigeria pay inadequate tax or no tax at all, which has led to substantial loss of government revenue. What is even more worrisome is seeing government entities failing to collect in part or whole taxes payable on public project transactions awarded to private companies' individuals, thereby creating fiscal shortfalls and aiding illicit financial flows. While government needs to constantly broaden its revenue base to meet core developmental obligations to citizens, it also owes them the duty to consistently and systematically reduce to the barest minimum leakages that could impede its revenue drive. Joining me today to discuss this and more are two gentlemen in the studio, Sahid Tafida, Lead Follow Taxes. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Nigeria. Thank you for having me. I also have with me in the studio the Head Financial Investigation Unit, Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, Michael Agoro. Thank you for joining us again today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure once again. Uh, so I, 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 I ask you, uh, Said, uh, you, you read the, I mean, you heard the opening remark I read out. Uh, so, I mean, 4.1 billion are not remitted in taxes, value added tax, withholding tax, and payee. Uh, there seems to be so much leakages in public finance, isn't it? It is a fact. I think it's not even a news anymore. All of us know there's a gap. There's so much the government and the policy makers need to do to make this thing more effective and more effective and more efficient, especially in blocking tax, re tax revenue leakages. Here, what we've discovered is amount of money that's supposed to be remitted from, from contracts that are given out by government entities to individuals, to companies, and that amount of money is not remitted, and which means the income has already been paid to the person and the money has passed. Now, this is a gap, really. And how really do we fix such gaps is really something serious. First of all, is the whole general issue of the need of even the technical, or let me say the accountants working to understand the implication of their own action. Because unless we own the problem, we understand the implication, it becomes difficult to even sort it or solve it. When you don't know you're supposed to deduct and remit, then it becomes a challenge. Are you saying this is a capacity uh, 
gap issue? If we say it is a capacity gap issue, then the Accountant General will start accusing us that we're saying they hired Inc. But when somebody bluntly makes such a mistake, I think it's the slightest excuse you can give him. If not that, why should there's a law that says if you give a person a contract, what the Accountant General's office gave is above 200000 it shouldn't be a direct level. There should be a withholding tax and VAT deduction and to be remitted. Refusal to do that is a crime that will take you to jail and you still did not do that. No. If I didn't call that a capacity, <laughs> I would rather say then he should be arrested. <laughs> now, okay, uh, uh, yeah, that's where I now go to Michael. You heard it, it's a crime not to do uh, you know, that which he, he just said. Now, but I, 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 I want to give you specifics now. Uh, from our review, of the 2016 audit report of the Federation. You have, for instance, at the Ministry of Works, Power and Housing, uh, about 673.6 million naira not deducted, not remitted to the Federal Treasury in value added tax and withholding tax. And this is the detail. Remittances of 5% VAT totaling 348.7 million naira and 5% withholding tax of 324.8 million naira were purportedly made to Federal Inland Revenue Service without evidence of e-ticket or receipts, remittances of tax without acknowledgement from either banks or Federal Inland Revenue Service cannot be accepted as genuine. I mean, those are the words of the auditors. Is it possible to, I'll, I, I, I'll come back to you, but I want to ask, uh, say it first, is it possible to remit without evidence? It starts the gap. The work of an auditor is to bring out a problem. If you have an evidence you provide, there is no complication here. Okay. You tell me you give me money. If I said you didn't give me, you should provide evidence that you've given to me. Now, what the auditors are saying is they did not see evidence. They even said they went to the records of FIRS. Yes. They didn't see that evidence. Mm -hmm. They went to the records of the bank. They didn't yeah. see that evidence. Yeah. Now, if you tell me you've given the bank or FIRS the money, because actually taxes are collected by banks, yes. transmitted via banks to CBN, then yeah. to FIRS. Yes. Now, the banks didn't see it. CBN didn't see it. FIRS didn't receive it. Then who did you give the money? Now, uh, Michael, what you have to say? He said it's a crime. Does your commission have, uh, I mean, the, does it fall under your commission's uh, uh, purview to begin to look into this, some of these issues? Have you looked into some of these issues before? All right. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate. The commission has broad powers. And um, in the past, we've actually ventured into tax matters. We have a collaboration with the Federal Inland Revenue Services and we investigate tax matters. So what I will encourage you to do as the anchor is, you can send a petition to the commissioner and I assure you it will be investigated. However, for me to comment on this matter we are discussing, uh, you've raised figures, 4.1 billion, 600 million, and so on and so forth. Uh, from the point of view of law enforcement, the first thing we do is to carry out an investigation to confirm authenticity or otherwise to see whether they have any reasons for not deducting or not remitting. Once this is done, then a uh, proposition can be made to the government itself. For instance, you can ask the commission can request the accountant general to deduct from source from these ministries. If it is sure that they, they did not remit, they okay. deducted, they did not remit, then the commission can uh, inform the accountant general to deduct from their present allocations. Okay. Then, another thing that can be done is prosecution of those who knowingly or unknowingly, wittingly or unwittingly, decide not to remit these um, this monies that were deducted. Okay. Sanction can be placed on the, uh, the, chief uh, the chief accounting officer of the organization, or also on the officer down below the line who refused to carry out his function. However, in order for this not to happen again, because you're talking about 2016 and we're in 2019, going to 2020, yes. I would also suggest that there should be a timely audit by the Inland Revenue Services so that um, these things will be forestalled. And lastly, uh, there's a practice in the UK when the government is paying a contractor, 100% of the money goes to the bank. At the bank, it is segregated, 90% goes to the contractor, remaining 5% that 5% with all the is swept to the Inland Revenue. So that way, there's no leakage in the system. Now, uh, say, uh, this appears, I mean, when you look at it, 
it looks like a deliberate act. Uh, because um, these are accounting officers who have been doing these things for a number of years. They, I mean, they can't claim ignorance, that they don't know whether they should retain some sort of amount of money for government or... So, is this like a kind of collusion between public officials and private contractors? Um, two things to it. First, I want to add to what he discussed. Presently, Nigeria operates a system that we truly give me system. The give me platform, any payment made via the give this platform is automatically built to that source. Okay. Now, in 2019, 2018, you will see this problem again because as soon as they impute the money to pay the person, the machine knows the calculation. Okay. They remove the VATs, they remove the withholding tax. And if it's a good tax, it's 10% or 5%, it does the calculation. So that, I think, we'll be happy to say, we won't say, but okay. we still want to get our money. The one that is spending in the past. <laughs> so still want to. Second, you're asking if it is a deliberate kind of system. From the first entry point, I use the issue of maybe poor technical knowledge. Take, for example, these things. If we can find 4.1 billion missing, the federal government that is not remitted because calling it missing, let me call it not, not, remit, not remitted. In the states, you may find 10 times that or even 100 times that because that's where you have more gap of technicality. Some of them really doesn't understand what they're supposed to do. That's a fact because the whole of tax system, as a person who tried to analyze and simplify tax system, one thing we learned is the whole of tax system is crafted by lawyers. So sometimes it's not easy just to read through the lines and understand. You may be surprised, part of this money, you find that they actually did remit it. But instead of remitting it with their name as an agency, they remitted it with the name of the contractors. So it will never show any evidence that they actually did pay the money. To them, they didn't even get the money. They actually did remit it, but they remitted wrongly. So there's a possibility, one slight possibility, it's a, it's a problem of capacity. But there's the huge monster, the big elephant in the room. There's a very good possibility it's deliberately done and it is actually an act of corruption, which is a role that needed to be investigated. Now, on, on, that, on that issue of act of corruption, should citizens now be the ones to bear the burden of corruption? That's the question, because government now says, I mean, in order to generate more revenue, it increases VAT from 5% to 7.5%, pushing that burden of corruption back to citizens. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems we're facing. We once had a program, the actual cost of corruption. Corruption has actually a cost. Take, for example, the remedy August spoke about now. The remedy of saying account to general office will be asked to the doctor source. Remember, the money given to Federal Ministry of Works is not actually for Federal Ministry of Works. Yeah. It's for providing roads by Federal Ministry of Works, yeah. providing buildings by Federal Ministry of Works, providing housing by Federal Ministry of Works. Now, out of the same money that would have been used to spend in 2019, but because a certain accountant made a mistake and the money was not remitted right in 2016, it will be reduced again. Yeah. And it means the amount needed to build the road is reduced. So at the end, both ways, who suffers it? At the end, we're going to suffer. Yeah. So bottom line is, we just have to make sure that it didn't happen. Because so far it's happening, then getting it solved always comes with a cost. It's either a present cost or advanced cost, but it is always going to come with a cost. Another important point from this that we should all learn from it is, in everything when it comes to withholding taxes, when it comes to VAT, when it comes to deductions, making sure it goes, withholding tax to be specific. If this money was not deducted at source and the person was paid his money in full, now when you deduct the money at source in 2019, you want to use it to offset payments of 2016. Who are you going to pay the money in name of? Remember withholding taxes and amount of money you withhold in the name of a certain person. Exactly. Now you withhold the money. At first he ate the whole money. Now you withhold the money and you want to pay it as withholding tax. Are you still going is to this pay it? Is this is it even possible? It, because if they are going to with, it's by law, it's going to be withheld by accountant general's office. There is that law already is existing. Okay. If you did not comply, you can be reported after due investigation of the fall of the ministry, the amount will be deducted as such. No, no, what, what I'm saying is that whether I mean if we if we're unable to track the contractor anymore or No, the, the contractor it, will be tracked. Okay. The money will be deducted as source now. Okay. Now what I'm just saying is are we going to pay in the name of the contractor again? That, that's the question. Because we're going to dash the contractor a credit note. I mean, money that he has taken already. Yeah, because it's a credit. And unfortunately, that's what the, that's what withholding tax is. So it's still a credit. So it's one of the confusions that is yet to be solved. So best is maybe if it is withheld, it should all be called value the tax. If you do that to dash states too. So there's a gap there. But in reality, is yes. Let's just make sure it didn't happen. 
And with the Givenist platform, as I said, I know it's going to stop happening. In fact, it has stopped happening because it's not a source. However, however, there's still a remitter window. Okay. The remitter window, the accountants generate the payments themselves. And because they generate the payments themselves, there's still that window of them leaving a gap not generating the payment. Okay. Through Givenist platform, hardly will it happen. Okay. And this is only at the federal, so at the state, I don't know. Maybe we need we need uh, safety. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but uh, but Michael, now he uh, um, say he talked about uh, the fact that corruption has a cost. Indeed. Yes, and uh, and that indeed that it's at the end of the day, it's citizens that bears this cost yes. of corruption. From your work, uh, what what you how, how do we limit this cost to citizens? See, because at the end of the day, when we don't have, I mean, when we don't have enough revenue, uh, certainly there will not be enough money to finance the budget. And if there's not enough money to finance the budget, there will be limited uh, uh, spending on developmental uh, uh, programs of government. And if that is the case, definitely we won't be able to close poverty gap, inequality gap, and all of those things. So how do we, you know, in essence, I mean, uh, with uh, what ICPC is doing right now and what he intends to do further, how do we limit this cost of, of corruption to citizens? All right. Uh, I'll, Particularly I'll, in relation to tax. Yeah, I would just like to make an addition to this issue of whether we should increase or reduce um, the VAT uh, because of the leakages in the system. Now, let me give you three propositions. Tell me the one that is most sensible. Because of leakages, we reduce VAT to zero. Does it make sense? I don't think so. Okay, the second proposition, there are leakages. Do we still maintain 5%? It still doesn't make sense. But the third proposition, we increase VAT and we block the loophole, loopholes. It makes sense. Are we blocking the loopholes? No, I'll come to address that. So on this issue of either increase or reduction, if I say yes, increase, I'll be anti-people. If I say no, don't increase, I'll be anti-government. So let us now look at statistics of some countries. I'll give you their VAT rates. For example, Algeria, the VAT rate is 19%. Argentina, VAT rate is 19%. Austria, 20%. Sh um, Chad, 18%. Chile, 19%. Congo, 18%. Denmark, 25%. Hungary, 27%. Ghana, 12.5%. Morocco, 20%. Nigeria, 5%. But to look at the statistic worldwide, there is room for increase. However, for government to justify the increase, it is incumbent on government to block these loopholes. Because think about Hungary, their VAT rate is 27%, and the citizens are not complaining because they see the value of the VAT in their lives. Similarly, if the government wants to follow the international community and improve VAT, then it must block the loopholes. Now, the, the concern, uh, I, I, I know you will finish your thought on that, but I, I just wanted to quickly put this through to you. Uh, the concern is, when you look at the budget, uh, is there any justification for revenue incre increase in, I mean, mopping revenue? Because when you look at the budget, the budget is structured, even at the center, uh, we're struggling to maintain 30% of capital. Uh, and same thing for, for most of the states, struggling to reach 30% for capital. So when you say you want to generate more money, more money for what purpose? It's a question. Because if you are generating more money to finance the elite, generating more money to finance the political class, then how does it make sense in that regard? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And that brings us back to the basics. Because assuming there's no oil in Nigeria, we will still finance government. Certainly. And one way you finance government is through taxation. Yes. It's done worldwide. Yes. Now, if you look at 2020 proposition, the budget proposal, 2.1 trillion goes for debt servicing, while 3.1 trillion is for capital. You can see that debt servicing alone is almost matching up with cash in capital. capital. And what is the reason for this debt overhang over the years? It's because the tax authorities, they are not generating enough. And government must run. If they don't generate enough, government will borrow. And once government borrow, it has its own implication, which reduces, which induces poverty in the system and reduces the value of life to Nigerians. So that is why we say that this issue of blocking the leakages, the loopholes, killing the monster corruption, 
must be taken seriously by government. Once government take this very seriously and those leakages are blocked, even if they want to increase it to 50%, and the people see that there is evidence that the tax deducted is used for them, they'll be willing to pay. Yeah, thank you on that. Uh, so, Said, is our tax system effective, efficient? If they are not, what are the challenges? Yes, before I answer that, I want to start with the challenge of he said you should petition on this. To be sincere, if PLSI did not petition ICPC on this case, I'll petition PLSI for aiding and abetting. I can, I can, I can assure. I can assure you. PLSI for aiding and abetting. I can assure you will yes, do that. That is one. Two. So, in reality, it can go far from what he said. One of the best ways to solve everything is to remove the human factor. When we talk of stamp duties, the challenge of stamp duties, which is one work we did on uh, e-commerce. Most of the finances that we do, most of the work we do, we buy so many things online. Some of them not even Nigerian companies. And because there's no any form of tax attached to it, we lose so much money. Because I can go now and pay for a certain subscription for an email, for example, which I use for my company. Yeah. I can pay for that. I pay it to Google and it is directly to the Google account. It's not taxed. Nigeria doesn't even know I've done it. But imagine if there's a certain form of tax attached to that payment. So it's actually also good. Only we need to reform it. I just wanted to add answer with these yep. Now, automation. FRS, some of these states have done well in automation. But up to now, we are actually at the stage of administrative automation, not the collection automation. Okay. Up to now, the collection system in the hand of the banks, hand of uh, the giant, new giant monster called the Remitter now, who will make so much money and they gain it. Now, we can actually do real automation. There is a study factored on the, these people, um, Ethiopia, when they did, they automated the VAT collection process. It's actually been done. This 7.5 can easily be everybody must install a certain machine, install a certain software. Then, as soon as you make the payment, automatically you get the record in the office. So, so person must remit this amount. It's already recorded. In fact, I've been to developed countries. In, should I name? I don't have to mention the country. I went there. I bought a phone. When I bought the phone, after I came back, I noticed it's having issues with my SIM, so I took it back. When I took it back, he said, but I can upgrade this and give you what will work in your country. But there's two things. If you pay me with POS, which means I'm going to enter it in the machine, you're going to pay so so dollars. If you're going to give me cash, you're going to pay so so dollars. As person who work around taxes, I say, what's the difference? Said, if you pay through machine, the machine will record that I've made this transaction, so I must remit the tax, so you must pay the tax. You know, it's not me that will pay the tax. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to give me cash, I will understand your situation. Just change the phone and give <laughs> <laughs> The guy is an Indian. Yeah. <laughs> He's in the Western countries. Yeah. So um, trust me, I, I stood there and I asked him, just because I want to understand how the whole thing works, I said, okay, give me, I'm going to give you cash. Then after he gave me, then I looked at the prices, I looked at the difference, I said, okay, then I'm going to pay you with the machine, you're going to be, he said, it's my money, and I just give me back, I yeah. just want to pay, I want to collect the evidence, yeah. hope you're not going to report anywhere, I said, no, I just want to see the difference, I just purposely, I still keep the two yeah. receipts, just to see the difference, anyway, what I'm just trying to say is full automation, yeah. full automation is key. And now there's also this fear. So as I for others will be saying that they're going to take our jobs. And in reality, all you need is to change the job. If your job was a manual clerical work of taking paper from point A to point B, now the job that is required is transforming the paper into a machinery, machine readable format. Mm -hmm. So pick that as a job. If you do that, then you're not going to lose your job. I think it is key all the processes should be automated. This is the same thing with the process of the collection and the remittance. But what Give Me has done is very excellent. I think it needs to be done in all the other states so that as soon as the payment is made, deductions are made automatically. At this point, the only people we have to deal with will be the public uh, the pri public officials okay. who are working in the account. Yeah. And thank God we have ICPC and EFCC. Who can that. take it? Who so can take care of that? <laughs> Those ones, I yeah. like things with yes. Yeah. Sometimes you just get results before they even start the investigation. Yeah. They just said, Mr. A, please come. Next, they'll call you. And that contract, that, that, I beg, why do you have to tell them that we're coming to finish it next week? Yeah. They didn't even go. Before they go, they'll just tell them we're back on site. Yeah. Don't mind these boys. And so, sure, that's come. What we want is a work game done. Yeah. yeah. And so we did them. Thank you very much. It's on that note that we'll draw the curtain on today's uh, edition of Val for Money TV show. I've been discussing with uh, Saeed Afida, the lead follow taxes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Nigeria. I've also been discussing, yeah. yes, thank you. I've also been discussing with um, Agboro Michael, Head Financial Investigation Unit, uh, Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC. Thank you for coming. 
It's my pleasure. Yes, Value for Money is a project of Program Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI, and it is supported by the European Union Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Rollout Program. So we come your way again next time. Always remember that public accountability is possible only with a vigilant and involved citizenry. I remain yours sincerely, Olusha Gwenlemo. Thank you for being part of today's program. See you next time. God bless Nigeria.